There it is. Okay. That should be good. Can you hear me now? All right. It's that secret place. It's a place of relationship. It's a place of coming together. You know, for those of you who are married, do you have that place where you and your wife like to go where nobody knows? That getaway, you know? Rose and I, we have some place. When we go on vacation, we like to go up to the mountains down in Virginia. There's no telephone in the room, and there's no signal for the cell phone either. <laughs> it's kind of a nice place to go. I thank God, you know, for relationships. We've been talking about, over the last uh, couple weeks, our relationship with God as it manifests in our giving. And as I said, and I'll, I want to say it again, that I'm not, I'm not preaching this because we need money. We don't. I'm preaching this because it's important you understand that this Christian thing is a serious matter. Relationships are a serious thing. And relationships take a lot of work. I don't know if you realize that, you know. A marriage relationship, that's the one that we associate with most. It takes a lot of work to be married. Uh, and, and you can love each other, but it doesn't just happen automatic. It takes a lot of work. I said most men, you know, when, when, when a man and woman get, get married, most men figure that's the finish line, and the women figure it's the starting line. <laughs> you know. And uh, it's the starting line. Because no matter how much you love each other, you've got to work. At that relationship. If you have a friendship, it requires work. And our relationship with God really is no different. I'm not saying we have to work to stay saved. Uh, don't misunderstand me. Our salvation is purchased by the blood of Jesus. And there's nothing we can add to that or take from that. Okay, that's, that's our salvation rests in there. But our relationship, our fellowship with God, we have a God that we fellowship with. One on one. We don't need a medium in between. We don't need a priest or a, or a channeler to go between us and our God. He, he made it so we can fellowship with Him by, through the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. But it's important that we understand that this relationship that we have with God, we need to maintain our relationship with Him so that we can, we can experience His presence. You know, if I never talked to my wife, and I've, I've used this illustration before, if the only thing I ever said to my wife was, what's for supper, it would not be a very good relationship. Okay. There's got to be more than that. All right. Uh, and my wife is saying, amen. <laughs> okay. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the very last book in the Old Testament. Malachi. See, I, I, believe, I believe God wants to speak to us this morning about our relationship with Him. If you've ever been in a relationship, when, when, you start, when things start to get a little cold, or when you start to get a little distracted, the other member of the relationship sometimes will, will, will drop hints to you. They'll say things and do things, and to, to let you understand that they're dissatisfied with a level of relationship. You know, God can do the same thing. God can do the same thing. He does things to get our attention. He does things to let us understand that maybe we're not spending enough time in that secret place that our sister sang about. Maybe we're not spending enough time in fellowshipping with Him. Maybe we're not spending enough time in the Word. We're going through the motions. We've got the external things together. But that, that, that time that He wants to spend with us, that intimate, personal time with us, there's lots of times and we let that go and God will have ways of letting us know that He's not happy with our relationship. It's that way in the prophet Malachi. This prophet prophesied about 400 years before Christ came. He's the last prophet included in the Old Testament. But he's not the last Old Testament prophet. The last Old Testament prophet was John the Baptist. He was an Old Testament prophet. And then we went into New Testament times. But Malachi was the last prophet included in the Old Testament. 
And at the time of his writing, the Jews, uh, God's chosen people, had been, they had been delivered into captivity because of idolatry. They were there for 70 years in Babylon. And they were allowed to come back under the Medo-Persian Empire and rebuild the city and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, although the temple they rebuilt was nothing that Solomon's temple was, but still they were allowed to rebuild the place where they could worship, where they could bring sacrifices and offerings. And they got the message about idolatry. I mean, if you read all the, all the pre-exile prophets, and it's getting a little technical, but all the, all the long ones, okay, uh, or Isaiah and Jeremiah particularly, they warned the Israelites, they warned, warned the Jews, they said, turn back to God, stop your idolatry, stop your idolatry, because God's going to send judgment. And they didn't listen, and God sent judgment. So they went into captivity for seven years, and when they came back, they made a resolution, and as a people, they said, we will no longer serve other gods. And during that time of their ca captivity and their time coming back, some groups rose up amongst the people of Israel. Uh, in the, if you read in the Gospels about the Pharisees, they had, their, they had their beginnings in that time of captivity and that time of return, where they, they began to study the law, uh, the law of Moses, and they began to get really strict about following the law because they never wanted to get anywhere close to, to falling into idolatry again because of what happened. So they began to, 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 to uh, establish this law, and they began to add things to it. That's why in the Gospels we read about they were holding Jesus accountable to a law that God hadn't written. Okay. So in Malachi, we have a situation where the people are back in the land. They have these pharisaical groups of people that are trying to establish the law. They don't want to fall into idolatry. They have priests. They have the worshipers restored. But something happened with the relationship. It had grown cold on the part of the people. And God is trying to get their attention. Now, have you ever, for those of you that have raised kids, have you ever walked in and saw your kid doing something? And you said, what are you doing? And the kid looks at you and says, whoa. Okay. Sometimes that's with husbands and wives too. Whoa. Okay. I want you to read with me in Malachi. And we're just going to start in verse 1. We're going to kind of jump through this morning a little bit. Okay. It says at the very beginning, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. In verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. God tells the people of Israel, I love you. And the people of Israel said, you've loved us? I mean, they had like an attitude. They might have felt that, that God had stopped loving them. Things weren't going the way they thought they should. So they, even, they questioned the love that God had for them. And God reminds them about how He chose them over their brother Esau and so forth. But I want you to drop down to verse 6. I want you to, some, to see some ways that we fail in our relationships with God. And this applies to all of us. This is Old Testament, but it, it applies to all of us. Because God's the same. And man is the same. Look what he says. Look at verse 6. God is speaking through the prophet. He says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts? Unto you, O priests that despise my name. God is saying, if you call me your father, and you call me your master, why don't you treat me like your father or your master? Man, there's a lot of folks today that call God their God, you're my God, but they don't treat him like God. I mean, do we know what we're saying when we say God? We know who we're talking about? You know, we just, we put that word out, God, 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 like it's just another, you know, like it's a baseball player or something. Do we understand who we're talking about? He says, you've despised my name. And the priest said, what? How have we despised your name? I mean, we're going through the motions. We're bringing the offerings, the sacrifices. We're practicing the Mosaic law, the Judaic religion. He says, how are we despising your name? This is how they were doing it. You offer polluted bread upon mine altar. The offerings that they were bringing 
to the Lord. And if you read through the Old Testament, there were all kinds of offerings and sacrifices they were commanded to bring. There were five main ones in Leviticus, but there were, there were other ones. Sin offerings and trespass offerings and so forth. And what he's saying was, the offering that you're bringing, that I have commanded, is, is polluted, it's corrupted. And they said, how is our offering polluted? In that you say, God says, the table of the Lord is contemptible. They had an attitude against God. They were going through the motions. They were doing the things that were prescribed in the Word. But they had an attitude against God. Because things weren't going the way they thought they should. God was not fulfilling the, the, what they thought He should as far as restoring the kingdom to Israel. So they were going through the motions. They weren't worshiping other gods. But they were doing it with an attitude. Oh, attitudes. Anybody here got any attitudes? Egos and attitudes. Big problem. Okay. He says in verse 9. Uh, verse 8, I'm sorry. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? He's saying, why, the, they were commanded, and they, when they brought an offering, they were supposed to pick the best specimen they could find. If it was a lamb, it was supposed to be a lamb without spot or blemish. Perfect. Whatever they were to bring, it was supposed to be the best they could find. But what were they doing? They were looking for the ones that they couldn't sell at the market. They were looking for the ones who were limping, or the ones who were crippled, or the ones who were born deformed. And they said, well, we'll just give them this. This is good enough for God. Do we understand when, when we bring an offering? Now, when we bring offerings, we don't bring lambs and goats. Please don't bring lambs and goats. I don't want them. Don't keep them on the farm. Okay. But we bring offerings of financial offerings. We bring offerings of ourself. If God gives us talents or the abilities to do things, we you know, make ourselves a living sacrifice. What, let me ask you, is what you do for God the best it can be? See, I stand convicted sometimes. I do. Sometimes, you know, it's time to prepare a message. And I kind of brush through and I, and I don't give the best. This is like Cain and Abel when they brought their offerings. God accepted Abel's, but he didn't accept Cain's. So I don't want that. How much of what we bring to God, whether it be monetary or whatever it might be, is the best we can bring? Done with, remember we were talking about the right attitude. Done with the right heart. Not done contemptibly. Not done because we think we have to. Not done with a grudge. But done because we want to worship the Lord. I said before, if, if you think, if you're going to put money in a box and do it with a grudge, don't put it in. Don't put it in. Because God won't accept that offering. God won't accept anything that comes from a darkened heart. He won't accept it. He might use it for something. But we think, there's, there's folks that think that we can, you know, there are people that will we'll give money to a church or we'll be philanthropic and that will earn, earn us points in heaven. God doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your stuff. He wants your heart. He wants that relationship with you. These priests had gone away from having a relationship where they were just going through the motions. And they had an attitude about it. We could talk a lot about that. We mentioned marriage. I won't go there. <laughs> you know, you ever get in a marriage and have an attitude about being married? Oh, okay. We won't. I can, I can, I can tell that's where. I can tell that we're not, we're not going to go there. All right. He says, he says, you offer, in verse 8, you offer the lame and the sick. Is it not evil? He says, offer it now to your governor. Go ahead and pay your taxes with that stuff and see what happens. You know, when I worked for 33 years in a mill, the first thing, the first line on that check was federal income tax. They took it right off the top. They took theirs. Then Medicare and all the other stuff. Then I got my, what was left. Go ahead. Tell the government, I'm not paying my taxes. I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll send, you, I'll send you a picture of my new car. He says, and verse 9, And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been uh, by your means 
Will he regard your person, says the Lord? In other words, he's saying, you know, you give God your second best, but when you get into trouble, you want his best. How, is it, you know, how does that work? Whether it be, and I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about time, I'm talking about talent, I'm talking about your devotion to serving the Lord, making yourself a living sacrifice. Are you doing it out of the right motive? Are you doing it out for the right reason? Are you doing it with a pure heart? Are you doing it to bless God and worship God? Are you doing it just because it's the thing to do? I've got to do this. I gotta... Might as well keep it. Might as well keep it. It says in verse 10, Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Do we get that message? That anything we do for the Lord needs to be done with the right motive, with the right agenda, with the right heart, as a relationship with Him. We serve Him because we love Him. We do what He tells us to do because we love Him. I hope. In a marriage relationship, you do what you do because you love your wife, you love your husband. You serve one another, you take care of each other. You got each other's back. Because you love each other. Amen? We've despised His name. We've, we've, we've turned our, our head and our heart. You know, on Wednesday nights we're looking at uh, some videos about things happening in the church. There, there, there are churches today that have that got rid of the cross, got rid of the blood. They don't want to deal with all that stuff. Instead, they present a religion. They present a, 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 a pra practices, religious practices that feel good, sound good, look good. But when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to teaching, they don't want that anymore because we, you know, sound doctrine will mess with your flesh all the time. Sound doctrine will step on your toes. If you hear somebody preaching the Word, they're going to say something that's going to make you uncomfortable about yourself somewhere down the line. Because that's what God's Word does. It doesn't want to make you feel guilty. It wants to make you feel convicted. But we've eliminated that. See, we're, we're trying to get to God by bypassing the cross. And you can't get there from here. We despise His name. Look, look down, just drop down a, a little bit. Look at for, uh, chapter 2. Just looking at a few verses this morning. Chapter 2 and verse 17. God says to the prophet, to the priest, You have wearied the Lord with your words. <laughs> you ever know somebody that you just get tired of hearing them talk? <laughs> somebody says, oh. <laughs> <I'm>, uh... <laughs> You've wearied, maybe you've been on that end. Maybe you've, maybe you've wearied somebody with your words. You ever been talking to somebody and you start looking at them and their eyes start going like this? Okay. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, what? Where have we wearied Him? When you say, here's how we weary God. Everyone that does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And He... Uh, delights in them, or where is the God of judgment? In other words, when we start questioning God's standards, and we, when we start trying to make God's Word fit our society or our situation or our circumstances, and we think God's going to bless sin, God gets tired of hearing our words. Sometimes we pray. See, you got... You, you, sometimes I wonder if sometimes when we're praying, God just says, stop praying. Now God wants to hear our prayers. He wants to hear. He's concerned with us. He wants us to speak to Him. He says, make your request known unto Him with prayers and supplication, with thanksgiving. It says in Philippians chapter 4. But we, we, need to, we need to be careful what we're praying for. Sometimes we pray for evil things thinking it's good. These last weeks have been the quietest weeks in this church. Sometimes we pray for things, and I've heard people pray, like, especially when it comes to like, things in the government. We pray for our government. I, I believe we pray for our president. We pray for our government. But you've got to be careful. You know, some, some people think that God's a Democrat. Or they think he's a Republican. Maybe they think he's a member of the Tea Party. God ain't none of that stuff. We need to watch how we pray. Because we might be praying for something evil. He says... You've wearied me. You say, everyone that does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. 
and he delights in them. Or where is the God of judgment? Well, where is God? He's letting all this stuff go on. Man, there's been some crazy stuff going on this last week, isn't it? Where's God? Well, God's where he's always been. There's always been crazy stuff going on. He just didn't have CNN to hear about him. There's always been crazy stuff going on. There's always been crazy people. There's always been evil people doing evil stuff. People say, where's God? Where's God? People in churches, people, preachers standing up and questioning, you know, if God is who he says he is, if he's almighty, if he's all powerful. People stand behind pulpits questioning that. People telling you that you've got to control your own destiny because God really doesn't care. They're doing it in churches with crosses on the door. He gets tired sometimes of hearing us rattle on and on and on and on and on. It's like talking heads on TV. Blah, 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 blah. Everybody's an expert on something. I hear some of these people on TV and I said, who made them an expert? Where did they get their, you know? We weary him. We despise his name. He weary him. We weary him. What else do we do? Malachi chapter 3. Now here we go. Somebody said, I've been waiting for this one. But you need to listen. Because it's not about putting your money in the box. Listen to what he says. Even from the days of your fathers, this is Malachi chapter 3 and verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, well, where shall we, we, we return? Here were people who had created laws upon laws upon laws upon God's law to keep them safe from falling into idolatry. They thought they were doing everything according to law and then some. They were getting like a 4.0 plus. And God says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Hmm. You have robbed me. And they said, well, how have we robbed you? And God said, in tithes and offerings. Lock the door. Okay. In tithes and offerings. A tithe, tithe means a tenth. Okay. Now, in the Old Testament, they were required, if you go back and you read the, the law in Leviticus, and uh, where they prescribe the offerings and so forth, they were required to bring a tithe, the first fruits of everything. When they had a harvest, they had to bring a tenth, present it to the priest. That was a worship offering unto God. They brought it, they had to bring it with the right attitude. They had to thank God for the ability to get the wealth because it's God that helped the grain to grow. It's God that gives you a job. It's God that pays the bills. It's God that gives you everything. 100% of it comes from Him. He asked in the Old Testament for a tenth. Now somebody say, well, this is the New Testament. We're not under that law. That's right. We're not. That's why I don't stand up here and harangue people about what they put in the box. See, that's between you and Lord, and, and, and the Lord. But I'm going to tell you what God's Word says. I don't want to see nobody's W-2 form. I don't care what you make or what you got. But this is between you and God. He said, will a man rob God? Tithes and offerings. Remember last week I said there's two basic ways you give money. There's some that goes into the storehouse and in inward giving. And then there's outward giving. There's to missions and to outreaches and so forth. There's both ways. And it's important that we do the both. Because everything, whether we put the money in or put the money out, we give it as unto the Lord. It is a worship offering. It's not just money. Last night, uh, Brother John shared a little bit about his missions trip. And we're, we're planning a missions program here in this church. And it's not about how much money we can raise. It's about blessing God with the stuff that He's given us. Those of you who know me long enough know I'm not a money guy. I'm not. I hate preaching about money. I do. I do. Because people get the wrong idea. He says, will a man rob God? Where have we robbed you? In tithes and offering. Listen to what he says. You are cursed with a curse. You know something I've learned? Since I've been saved. When I don't give, when I don't worship God with my stuff, He takes my stuff. 
God can't, can't, but give the Lord a hand, that's alright. If, if I don't worship God with my stuff, He takes my stuff. I could tell you some stories, but I don't think I would. If I don't, if I try to get over on God, He's going to get His. I'm just letting you know for your own. I just want you to have a good relationship with the Father. If, you know, see, this, this isn't about me. It's not about the church. It's about you and God. You're giving to Him, whether it be here or someplace else or whatever. You're giving to Him. When you give a tithe or an offering as unto the Lord, and you give it to some place where you're, you know that they're going to do with it what they say they're going to do with it, and, and th you're worshiping God. And if you don't do that, what you're doing, you're trying to worship Him in one way, but not this way. See, Pastor Harold, I always quote Pastor Harold, he says, you know how spiritual somebody is by uh, uh, looking at their Bible and looking at their checkbook. You worship God with your giving. If you don't worship God with your giving, you're going to miss something. I'm talking to believers. If you're not a believer, it doesn't, it doesn't, this doesn't apply to you. I'm talking to people that have owned Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If, if you're not a believer, then it doesn't matter. But if you're a believer, if you don't give God what's His, you're missing something. You're missing a blessing. In fact, you could be cursed with a curse. He says, you're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and there shall not be room enough to receive it. If we give God, you know, that what he requires, he's going to give us everything we need and more. He says it in his word. I'm not about a tenfold, six, I'm not a seed, faith, plant, I'm not about, I'm sick of hearing that stuff. It's just God's word. And he says, not only will I give you what you need in verse 11, but I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. You're missing a blessing if you aren't blessing God with your finances. Plain and simple. You say, well, I don't know if I can do a tithe. Do a half a tithe. Do it. Just, just, just step out in faith and bless God. If you don't want to do it here, do it somewhere. Just bless God. Step out in faith. And bless Him with some of your stuff that He's given you. And watch and see. If he doesn't bless you. I, you guys have heard me say this until you're sick of hearing me say it. We're getting, you know, we got this car, but we're getting these steps done here. I've never had to take a special offering in this church since we've been doing it. You know why? Because we bless God. With our, with, our, with our stuff. Every month we, we, we bless other ministries with our stuff. I have not had to take a special... I have not had to have a, had a spaghetti dinner. I have not had to done anything to raise money to get stuff done in the church. We've always had what we've needed. Because God is true to His Word. Because God is true to His Word. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord. He just wants us to know that we're missing a blessing if we don't bless him. One more thing. In verse 13. He says, your words have been stout against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? And he said this, you have said, it is vain to serve. See, I, I, feel, that, I feel that touching a nerve right now. Have you ever felt or have you ever thought that the Christian life is a waste. Have you ever been, have you ever got to the place where you said, you know, I was doing better when I was back in the world. They were saying, they were speaking against God. They said serving the Lord is in vain. It's emptiness. They were going through the motions. They were doing all the things. They had the offerings, the sacrifices. They had the, the tabernacle, the temple, all the stuff going on. But their attitude was, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? 
and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. He says, well, you know, I've been, I've been living this Christian life. I've been trying to do what's right. And what good has it done me? That's what they were saying. And that's what folks today say. I want to tell you something. So I, I, I think a lot of people, they've been sold a bill of goods about Christianity. Somebody told them somewhere down the line, well, you start, start serving Jesus and everything's going to be wonderful. Well, it is wonderful. It's good to praise the Lord. Isn't it? God can meet all our needs according to His riches and glory. That's what the Word says, doesn't it? But you know what? It also says all those who will live godly will suffer persecution. See, there, there are those... If you go back to like Psalm uh, 73, when Asaph, who was the high priest... He, was, uh, he wrote a psalm. He said, you know, when I beheld the prosperity of the wicked, my foot almost slipped. You ever feel that way? When you, when you look at all the wealthy people of the world with all kinds of money and they don't have to worry about paying bills and don't have to worry about, you know, where the, where the next uh, car payment is going to come from and they're driving big Austin Martins, all this other stuff, and, and they got all this money, and you look at them and you know they ain't living for God. And you say, well, I've been living for the Lord and I'm, you know, I can't afford that and I can't afford this. You ever, you ever, there, there's some folks that feel that way. God says, listen, you need to, you need to put that away. Because I'm going to give you everything you need. You be content with what I give you. And those people who are, they're, they're living good now, but when they die, if they don't get saved, they're going to go to hell. You ought to pray for their salvation. It's vain to serve God. That's what they said. And what profit is it that we have kept the ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Verse 15. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Aren't they set up? Boy, they're set up good. They've got mansions and all kinds of stuff going on. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. What God is saying is, list, is, saying is this, listen, now is not the time when we, we tell the difference between the wicked and the righteous. That time's coming. See, we need to get our eyes focused. When that Psalm 73, when Asaph uh, wrote that psalm, he said, I, my foot almost slipped when I beheld the prosperity of the wicked. And he went on and talked about how all the, you know, all the wicked people got it so good and this and that. But then he gets to the point where he says, then I stepped into the house of the Lord. Then I got the real picture. See, we need to get the real picture. What are we talking about? We start talking about relationships. We need to understand who God is and what He's done and what He's going to do and what His plans are. And the only way we can do it is by spending time in His Word, spending time in that secret place in prayer, uh, worshiping Him with offering, giving Him the best that we have to give, and listening to His voice. It's interesting that the very last chapter in Malachi, the very last words written in the Old Testament, are about what's coming. He says, verse chapter 4, For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all the do wickedly shall be stubble. I don't believe we should say that with glee. I think we need to say that with an understanding that we need to be about our Father's business, preaching God's Word, sharing our faith, sharing our testimonies, because somebody, some, somebody out there who is not saved needs to hear what we have to say. They need to hear our testimony. They need to hear what God has done for us. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Verse 2. But unto you that fear my name, listen. Unto you that fear my name, unto you with whom I have a relationship, unto you who worship me with the best you have, unto you who have not robbed me, unto you who have not despised my name, Shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in His wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. God is making a promise to His faithful people. Don't get weary in well-doing. 
Don't get weary in, in, doing, in, in, in doing what God has said to, said to do. Don't get weary in blessing God's house and, and giving the best that you have. Don't get weary. Sometimes it will seem like I'm doing this for nothing. Understand this according to God's Word. Everything you do for the Lord, everything you do with a pure heart, everything you do as a sacrifice unto God will come back to you in ways that you can't even imagine. The payoff is incredible. And it's not going to happen in this life. Oh, He can bless you in this. He can take care of you in this life. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But the real payoff when it really comes is when Jesus Christ returns to this place and catches us up to be forever with Him, uh, forever with the Lord, and, and establishes His kingdom on this earth. That's when the blessings are going to come. That's when the real payoff is going to be here. That's His promise. Verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb in all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth. Oh God. Had the Jews accepted Jesus as their Messiah, John the Baptist would have been accounted. But we know what happened. Elijah's still coming. Jesus is coming back. Things are coming upon this earth that would astound. That un, it's, it says, a time of tribulation unlike anything the earth has ever known. It's coming. We see the news, we hear the stuff, all this crazy stuff going on. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Are you ready? Are you ready? Is your relationship, listen, if you have a relationship with God, if you, if you went to the starting line of the cross and you establish your relationship with God, you know what? You're ready for anything. If your faith is in Him and you're, and you're, and you're keeping that relationship fresh, through, through prayer and fellowship with God and offering and giving and receiving from Him, if, if that's your relationship with the Father, then you're ready for anything this world has to offer. It doesn't matter if the government shuts down. It doesn't matter if they start dropping bombs all over the place. It doesn't matter because your relationship with God supersedes all that stuff. And what we have waiting for us, man, is way beyond anything we could imagine. Don't listen. If you're not saved this morning, if you're sitting out there and you're scratching your head and saying, this relationship with God, don't leave here not knowing the Lord. Come to the starting gate, the cross, the blood of Jesus. That's where we begin. If you're saved this morning, that's where your, that's where your life of salvation began, at the cross of Christ. The blood of Jesus that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins and not only to forgive your sins, but make you a new creature. To deliver you from the demons that have haunted you all your life. To break the chains of bondages that you've been in all your life. That's, that's, what's, that's what the blood of Jesus does. It makes, us, it makes us born again. A new creature. All things are passed away, all things will become new. That's the, that's the starting place. And that's the beginning of our relationship with God through faith in Christ that will continue on for all of eternity. That's what we're looking for. I want to pray this morning. And uh, thank you for sending through my messages about offering. See, it, I pray, and I've said this before, my prayer is when somebody walks in this building and they hear either myself or somebody else stand up here and preach the word, when they leave, they got something they didn't have when they come in. They got some little piece of knowledge. They got some little insight, some little revelation. Maybe a big revelation. They got something that they didn't have when they came in. If you, if you, never, if you never come back, if I never see you again, if you, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, my job's done. It's all about our relationship with God. I want to pray.
and we're going to close. And as, as usual, uh, well, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you, it says in your word, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And Father, when we read your word and we hear things and read things that causes us to look at ourselves and maybe be convicted about things in ourselves, Father, that's not a bad thing. That's the love of God reaching down to us, trying to make us the people that you want us to be. Father, you want to equip us, you want to establish us, you want to root us and ground us. So when the storms of life rage and when the winds blow and the, and the rains fall, we will be anchored and rooted on the rock. Father, I pray, Lord, that some of the words that were spoken this morning out of your word will touch somebody's heart, that somebody in here this morning will look at themselves and say, you know, i got to deal with this. Father, and, and, and fill in the blank. They can, everybody in here probably got something. So I've got to deal with this. For my relationship with the Father. Father, you speak to us to draw us into your kingdom and to draw us closer to you. The love that you have for us, oh God, it's unimaginable to us. Even greater than the, the, the love that any man could have for a woman or a woman could have for a man. The love that you have for us, Father, you want us all the time. You want us seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You want our, you want our attention. Father, any time of the day or night, you want us to be able to listen, to hear you. You want us to have a relationship with you that is a constant, not just a uh, two or three time a week thing, but a constant relationship based on our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ that we will hear from you and we know that you hear us. God, I pray for those in, in the sound of my voice that whatever has been stirred within them, that they would bring it to the cross this morning. That they would bring it to the cross this morning. That they would bring it to Christ this morning. For that, that thing, that one thing that we might have in our lives that has kept us from having a complete uh, intimate relationship with you, that one thing, we want to lay it on the cross this morning. We want to lay it down. Father, if there's grudges, if there's bitterness, if there's anger, if there, if there are th if things that go back years and years, Father, we want to lay it down in the name of Jesus. And ask you, Lord, to bring healing. You were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon you. And by your stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. Are you healed this morning? Are you, give the Lord a hand. Are you healed this morning? Be healed this morning. Won't you stand with me, please? Won't you, won't you stand with me? Be healed this morning. Be healed in your body this morning. Be healed in your spirit this morning. Be healed in your soul, in your emotions. Be healed this morning. Be made whole this morning. Hallelujah. Be whole this morning. Oh, God, let your Holy Spirit minister in the name of Jesus. Make us whole this morning. And that fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might, we might experience that, that intimate presence with you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, cleanse us from all our iniquities, Father. Break, us, uh, break the bondages in our lives, Father. Make us new in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh yeah, Hallelujah, Holy Spirit, Hallelujah, Glory to God, Hallelujah, You're worthy, God. You're a worthy God. God, You're worthy of our best. You're worthy of, of the best that we have. Oh God, we give You glory and honor. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. If you, you know, our sister just said, a living sacrifice. If you want to be a living sacrifice to God. Just lift your hands up this morning. It doesn't matter who sees or who doesn't see. God sees. Father, make us living sacrifices. Oh, help us, God. Father, when we get distracted, oh, God, God, help us. Wake us up, oh, God. Send your spirit to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God, help us be the people you need us to be, Father. We want to take your word seriously this morning. We want to take this relationship seriously. 
We don't want to be religious. We don't want to be Pharisees. We don't want to be self-righteous. We just want to be children of God. We want to have that relationship with our Heavenly Father where we can cry, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, those that have come against us, we pray for their, their healing. Father, we pray for, give us forgiveness in our hearts for those who have done us wrong. Help us be like Jesus, Father. Help us be lights in the middle of darkness in this world. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God. Bring healing to families, to marriages. Bring healing, Father. Oh, God, to children, parents, healing, salvation in our households. God, we're desperate. This world is getting oh, we're, this world is getting hard to live in. Father, we need you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Holy Spirit, have your way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God.